So hi, I'm Lily Green, so I'm a researcher at the Bennett Institute, and I'm going to give you an introduction into the amazing research outputs that have been produced using the Open Safety platform. So since becoming operational, Open Safety has produced a huge number of diverse research outputs. So we have over 40 peer-reviewed research papers, many of which have been published in high-impact journals such as Nature, Lancet and BMJ. We have many more papers that have been pre-printed, um, and of course there are still many more in development. We have written reports to um, key committees such as JCVI and NICE, um, and this is to help inform policy making. And on top of all of these, to provide near real-time analysis results on key topics, we have produced regularly updated reports and dashboards which are openly available on our website. So all of these research outputs produced using the Open Safety platform cover a huge range of COVID-19 topics. So these include COVID-19 risks, where, for example, we have looked at identifying ethnic inequalities in COVID-19 deaths. We have rapidly linked therapeutic data um, to patient records to look at coverage and effectiveness of COVID-19 treatment in the community setting. So there'll be more on this from Laurie next. We have looked at the consequences of COVID-19 by studying the outcomes experienced by COVID-19 patients, including emerging conditions such as long COVID. COVID-19 vaccines is possibly one of our largest areas of research, and this has encompassed everything from coverage through to waning, um, and you'll hear, hear more about this from Will shortly. So we've also looked at the impact of COVID-19 in terms of changes in clinical activity during and after the pandemic, so such as antipsychotic um, and antidepressant prescribing behaviour. So that covers the type of research outputs that we have produced um, and the areas that these cover. So now I'm just going to talk about some of the early published work um, that we have done in a bit more detail. So where's the best place to begin? Well, let's start with the first ever open safety study, factors associated with death from COVID-19. So on the 7th of May 2020, which was only about six weeks since um, Open Safety's birth, so yes, if you didn't hear that, six weeks, which is pretty impressive, uh, we pre-printed the world's largest ever study describing which subpopulations were most likely to die from COVID. So this work was on an unprecedented scale of data, so it used the health records of about 40% of the English population. We quantified a large range of clinical risk factors for death from COVID-19, uh, which are shown in this figure on the left-hand side of the slide, which you probably can't really see very well, but um, feel free to ask any of us about it later, or you, know, you can read our paper online. So the good, great thing about this paper was the speed and the scale of it. So it provided critical information to SAGE in their continued development of the shielding risk groups. So what do we do next? Well, ethnicity was identified as an important factor in our first ever paper, and as such, capitalised on the rapid real-time linkage of routine data sets available in Open Safely to explore a range of urgent questions um, surrounding ethnic inequalities in much greater detail. So our study, which included over 17 million adults, confirmed that ethnic minority groups experienced disproportionately higher levels of poor COVID-19 outcomes. So this was true even after accounting for other factors known to increase risk, such as deprivation, household size, and underlying health conditions. So another great thing about the study is we were able to use 16 categories of ethnicity. So that was in addition to the standard five categories that were typically reported elsewhere. So desegregation into these detailed ethnic categories suggested that multiple factors were likely to contribute to ethnic inequalities the importance of each factor varying by ethnic group. So these results made um, several major news headlines and highlighted the utmost need to reduce structural disadvantage and equality and improve the quality of and access to healthcare. Um, so HIV has been shown to be associated with a higher risk of severe outcomes from respiratory infections. So given this, and the fact that HIV was identified as a potentially important factor in our first open safety paper, and the little evidence that existed at the time around HIV and COVID-19, we undertook a study early on in the pandemic to compare the risk of COVID-19 death between people with and without HIV. We included over 17 million people in our study, um, of whom about 23,000 were living with HIV. 
and we found that the absolute cumulative COVID-19 mortality was low, with less than about 0.1% of people with HIV dying with COVID-19 as a cause, as a cause uh, which kind of reflected the young age profile of the population. So while the crude risk of COVID-19 death was similar in people with and without HIV, after accounting for demographic characteristics and lifestyle associated factors, HIV was associated with a nearly three-fold higher risk of COVID-19 death. So given the little and often conflicting evidence that existed at the time, these results highlighted the need for further verification, monitoring and evaluation of the effects of HIV on COVID-19 outcomes, especially in countries with a higher prevalence of HIV. So in addition, these results indicated that targeted policies should be considered to be addressed to address the apparent raised risk the pandemic evolved. Um, so another great study that we did um, was uh, we called it the snotty noses. So it was clear early on in the pandemic that children were relatively protective from COVID-19. However, there was much speculation about whether contact with children actually afforded adults a degree of protection from COVID-19. So a lot of people believed that if you lived with kids, um, that actually you'd be offered some form of cross-protective immunity. And then there were other people that believed that living with children would elevate your risk um, of getting COVID-19. So in the latter half of 2020, in the face of increase, increasing transmission and the need for policy decisions about schools reopening, we investigated the potential effects of living with children on the risk of infections and severe outcomes from COVID-19. So our study included over 12 million adults and we found that, um, in contrast to the first wave, there was evidence of increased risk reported um, of COVID-19 infection and outcomes among adults living with children during wave two. Um, however, this did not translate into a materially increased risk of COVID-19 mortality. Um, again, as can kind of be seen from the figure, uh, the absolute increase in risk were quite small. So these findings, in consideration alongside other evidence that was available at the time, um, I find it really important in helping to determine the benefit-harm balance of children attending school in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so the last one I'm going to talk about is uh, so long COVID. So in 2021, the Open Safety Platform grew and we were able to use 58 million patients' GP records for studies into COVID-19. So that's 96% of the English population. Given the growing number of people who were unable to shake off the effects of COVID-19, months after initially falling ill within this huge cohort we um, measured the number of people the recorded code for long covid and found that only 23,000 had a formal diagnosis of long covid in their medical records so this was about 100 times smaller than the number that had been reported um, by a major survey at the time there was also a big difference in the coding behaviors of gps using different electronic systems so raising important questions about how long COVID was diagnosed, recorded and managed in the NHS. So we alerted the systems to this and EMIS and TPP made changes to their user interface to make relevant codes more accessible and NICE incorporated our work into review on their rapid guidance on managing the long-term effects of COVID-19. So to monitor the, these coding behaviours, we then routinely updated our results from our paper on the Open Safety Reports website. Um, and I think this is still going on today. Um, so since these early outputs, the outputs of Open Safely Collaborative have been numerous, and as COVID-19 evolved, so too did our platform and the types of questions that we addressed. As such, we have been delivering important research for the NHS and policymakers to help inform the national response throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, which you will now hear more about from my colleagues. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm Laurie Tomlinson and I'm a member of the EHR uh, group, the Electronic Health Records Research Group at LSHTM. And Ben mentioned earlier that uh, really this was a collaborative process between the two of us very early on and we came over to help the team here with uh, trying to develop academic output using Open Safely. And I can say it's been an, an extraordinary experience. Almost all members of the group have worked on Open Safely at some point. Um, bringing their kind of long experience of working with uh, EHR data to try and help the, the Bennett Institute in 
generate a lot of rapid uh, academic output to support policy, as Millie was just saying. And we have been uh, very um, involved in lots of papers, some of the ones that, that Millie was discussing and, and many others. One of the huge advantages of um, open safety is ability to rapidly link other, other data sources. And in, towards the end of 2021, there were a number of new treatments for COVID-19 as outpatients being licensed. And um, these, we were fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to link these data. And work led by Millie, she was able to um, set, uh, rapidly report against this data, showing uptake um, as, as a dashboard, as she just described, for long COVID. Um, enabling us to kind of track the use of these drugs in real time and in particular look for socio-economic and ethnic inequalities in their use to try and improve uptake. But we were also able to go on and use these, these data for research and that was really important. So one of the problems with the COVID therapeutics is that in the original randomised trials these were conducted against the original COVID variant or, or the, the Delta variant and so as, as you all know, COVID rapidly mutated and there would be a rapid change in the prevalence of the circulating variant over time. And so it was unclear if the drugs were still effective because the clinical trials showing their benefits had been conducted against earlier variants. So that was one uncertainty about their, their ongoing clinical use. But there was also basic science data. So lots of people were running assays uh, using the, uh, the COVID therapeutics against different types of uh, COVID and showing that, certainly against uh, using some of the drugs, there appeared to be a loss of effectiveness of the treatments. And some of the data was very conclusive, it no longer worked. Some of it, there was a, a middle ground where it was uncertain about the level of clinical benefit. And there was a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of um, discussion about the different types of assays and the, the varying basic science. So this led to a critical question for the UK Health Service. As we moved out of uh, the pandemic situation, we were trying to go back to routine use and routine pathways for drug use in, in clinical care. Which drugs should NICE recommend for routine use for outpatient treatment for COVID? So in their initial decision, based predominantly on the historic evidence that they used about randomised trials, uh, including some basic science, was to reject the use of citruvimab, a monoclonal antibody, where it was uncertain whether it was still effective. Uh, and this was in keeping with the World Health Organization and the FDA in America who, who rejected citruvimab very early on. But unfortunately, this left a vulnerable population. We knew from other work that patients with advanced kidney disease, particularly those with organ transplants, were at the highest risk of severe COVID-19 outcomes. But they were unable to use Paxlovid, which was the most common, use, uh, the most common drug, the one that NICE was continuing to recommend for outpatient use. So we were able to use the, the data that we had linked to look at the comparative effectiveness of two drugs, comparing citruvimab and molnupiravir. They were the earliest drugs, and so in the initial period there was therapeutic equipoise. Clinicians could recommend either of these drugs, and so it was a very good um, a natural experiment for looking at the effectiveness of these two, medi two medications. And what we showed was that the citruvimab, the monoclonal antibody, was more effective than molnupiravir, we tried very hard to look at the data in different ways, different modelling strategies. Whatever we did, we showed similar, uh, similar results. Um, and at the time when we were doing this study, we didn't have any kind of ex external benchmarking to compare, event, to compare against. But as it was coming towards publication, the panoramic study came out showing no effect of, of um, on the pyruvir pre for preventing severe outcomes. And so kind of giving this baseline um, validation for our, for our work, which is very reassuring. We've gone on to use uh, this data in other ways. Um, Seba mentioned earlier about some of the external linkages that we have, and we've linked to the UK Renal Registry platform, which, uh, which identifies patients receiving dialysis or with kidney transplants very accurately. And so we could look within that very high-risk subgroup and also compare our data to the Scottish Renal Registry, again, providing mm -hmm. further validation. And we've also been able to now look at Paxlovid as well. The, the more commonly used drug. But what was incredibly, um, incredibly valuable about this data and, and, and very heartwarming for us was that NICE were able to use some of this data in their, in the, their subsequent um, decision-making process after the initial draft, which I mentioned. Historically, NICE have been very wa wa wary of using non-randomised data. 
This is a slide taken from the public consultation uh, when they went on to produce the final, um, the final decision, and you can see that they recommend that we should consider the open safety data because of the efforts we've made to try and deal with bias and confounding. And even more importantly, perhaps, we were able to provide Knights with data, so they needed to know up-to-date hospital admissions for high-risk subgroups in order to um, inform their health economic modelling, and so we were able to provide very up-to-date data across different subgroups which they were able to use. And the very uh, the wonderful part of that was that when NICE recommended the final treatments uh, that in the final guidance, they had re-included Citrivimab, uh, and that was in part uh, due to this use of observational data. So the, the work I've just highlighted, I think, shows the strengths of Open Safely. This very rapid uh, updated data with rapid data linkage, highly granular, enabling us to assess many of the factors that might have informed the decision-making process about who got which drug to try and robustly look at comparative effectiveness. And this collaboration between uh, both our groups and uh, many, many people with different uh, academic strengths who came together to produce this work and hopefully uh, went on to inf influence decision making and we're now going on to monitor subsequent effects of those drugs. Hi everyone, it's me again. Um, these, the, the, the sessions, the talks that follow are all sort of rapid fire talks, so I'm going to keep this one quick. Uh, and I'm going to talk about vaccine effectiveness, which is um, a big component of the work that we've been doing using Open Safety. So, first of all, why bother with <coughs> vaccine effectiveness studies? The early randomised trials that looked at effectiveness were incredibly um, successful. You can see on these two graphs, which show Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccines that were both incredibly successful at reducing infection and that led to a, uh, a huge national rollout of the vaccines which led to reduction in infections and hospitalizations and so on and that was great and that was basically one of the key things that led us out of the pandemic um, but it, th those, those trials weren't able to answer all the relevant questions in terms of what's important about deploying uh, vaccines and in whom should they be deployed so things like sick people who weren't eligible for inclusion in the original trials of children, uh, long-term effectiveness for severe outcomes, boosting uh, comparative effectiveness between two different types of vaccines. Drug companies weren't particularly interested in finding out whether their, their drug was worse than another one. And of course, as Laurie mentioned, whether these treatments are, or uh, preventative treatments in this case are effective against the new variants that were constantly um, emerging over time. So. In order to answer those questions, we need to turn to observational data. This is the Open Safely Vaccine Effectiveness Working Group. People from Bristol, from Bennett, from London School, from Harvard. Ben sometimes pops in to uh, say some interesting things. <laughs> and pretty much since day one of the vaccine rollout in early 2020, we've been thinking about how best to answer these questions that the trials weren't or couldn't, they couldn't answer. So here's some of the things we found out. Firstly, comparative effectiveness of Pfizer versus um, which one's this? <laughs> AstraZeneca versus Pfizer basically were as good as each other when used as a first dose. Um, Moderna was slightly better than Pfizer when used for boosting. Uh, it's really, really difficult to estimate long-term effectiveness. So these thing, things like waning is what we call it, the reduction in effectiveness over time basically because the people who have remained unvaccinated for a long time are very unusual and they're not suitable as controls for the people who have been vaccinated for a long time. We've got a couple of papers showing how to estimate effectiveness robustly um, and obviously all the code for this is open so that if you want to use it in your own data sets that's possible. Uh, that's another study showing how to estimate waning um, when it's really difficult, basically it's not possible. Uh, we've got a study here looking at effectiveness of booster doses. Uh, we've got more coming on second dose, uh, second booster doses in, in autumn last year. We found protection of people with chronic kidney disease was improved by having a vaccine that's different to your previous dose because of mixed dosing and heter heterologous uh, vaccine schedules. And loads and loads of other things, looking at effectiveness in kids soon or now. We've got looking at effectiveness in cancer and other groups. Lots more planned. This is a sort of schematic of the sort of stuff we've been doing. 
Um, please come and say hello. I'm happy to talk to you at you about vaccine effectiveness for hours and hours. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so I hope you, we've convinced you all that we are productive. We ship papers and we deliver impact. But what really transformed our impact was when we got your user commit. We built a platform for ourselves. We did a lot of research by it. We had to do it in the early days. But we were always building towards with building it for the public, building it for England, building it for the world. Uh, and you go hear from some of the organisations today. It was a quite a hard job to pick who could come, but we had lots of volunteers. Over the course of Open Safety, we had 23 organisations uh, with over 60 projects. You've heard about our wonderful co piloting team. You may have heard about our quarterly form, maybe some of you have come to it. Um, lots of outputs. There's some of the organisations that have um, participated, use Open Safety to help inform their own work. Some of you are here. Some of you are here to haven't used Open Safety. If you would like to use Open Safety, please come talk to us later on. But you can also go to jobs.opensafety.org forward slash apply. You don't even need to talk to us. Just put your details in there and Amir and Liam will pick it up. There will be a little bit of pause for a few weeks, Amir mentioned, mainly so we can all have a bit of a sleep. It's been a, a busy three years. Uh, so please do come use Open Safety and then we'll hear from some of the people who have been using it. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Mark, I'm a rheumatologist and NHR doctoral fellow at King's College London. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about how we try to use Open Safety to replicate the national early inflammatory arthritis uh, in England and Wales. So a bit of background, so as rheumatologists we see rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, all autoimmune conditions that if you don't treat it promptly and relatively aggressively, you can get lots of disability, uh, joint replacements, and this is what you might have seen in clinic 20 or 30 years ago. But it's been recognised now that if you treat these conditions promptly with immunomodulatory drugs, such as biologic drugs, uh, drugs methotrexate for example, patients do really well. And so our goal now uh, is remission for most patients. Uh, recognising this, uh, so NICE produced several quality standards over the last few years for these conditions uh, about targets that we should be meeting, uh, both in primary and secondary care. And then following on from that, HGRIP commissioned a national early inflammatory arthritis audit. So all hospitals in England and Wales should be contributing data on all new inflammatory arthritis patients and enrolling them into this national audit. Now currently that's produced as an annual report and we get nice statistics sort of nationally like this about what proportion of patients are seen by their rheumatologists within three weeks, what proportion get these disease modifying drugs uh, within a certain time frame, and then broken down both by high level region and then individual trusts too. But there are problems with this and one is that it requires manual data entry by clinicians uh, and I can say this because my boss isn't here, clinicians hate manually entering this data after clinic and so that means that engagement's nowhere near as good as it should be. It potentially introduces bias because you get departments with more resource entering data and others not uh, and also manual data, sorry, mandatory data collection was paused during the pandemic so we had no good idea of what happened during the pandemic itself. So our aim was to try and use Open Safely to replicate key metrics from the national audit and then use this approach to try and see what happened during the pandemic. Uh, so just to pick out a few, a few things, so this is looking at disease incidents or recorded disease incidents um, and this is, the black line there is the combination of those diagnoses I was talking about, so rheumatoid, psoriatic arthritis for example. And you can see that things were ticking along until you get to the vertical dashed line which is the start of the first lockdown and then diagnoses uh, fall off a cliff to so about 40% reduction that lasts for a few months and then actually by October 2020 nearly back, well pretty much back to pre-pandemic trends and then things tick along and then with the, the eye of faith towards the right hand side of the graph December 2021 there's another 30% drop which corresponds roughly to the Omicron wave but given there were some periods there where diagnoses are much lower than you'd expect you might then expect an overshoot in diagnoses uh, when things were quieter but we haven't seen that yet we've got data up to January 2023 which suggests that some people at least are undiagnosed as a consequence of the pandemic what about actual so for people who did present care that they receive well this is a time series analysis and each dot there is the proportion of newly, di newly diagnosed patients who were seen by the rheumatologist within, within three weeks of seeing their GP and it was about 50% pre-pandemic and then as you get towards March 2020, actually things didn't drop off and if anything they got better uh, or con there was a continued trend to improvement during the pandemic. So at least for those people who did see their GP, things were no worse uh, than they were pre-pandemic. 
And there was a bit of variation by region in England, but actually the more consistent pattern was that most regions improved in year two, which is the first year of the pandemic in this, relative to year one, which was the last year before the pandemic. What about time to starting those, the important drugs like methotrexate? Um, uh, again, so you, you'll see sort of the average portion of, of newly diagnosed patients there. And there was a bit of a drop off in March 2020 and April 2020 of about 10%. But by May 2020, we're back to where we were pre-pandemic. So again, less of an impact than you might expect for people who uh, sought medical attention. But there was variation by region of England. So if you focus down there in the southwest of England, they were much better at many other regions at getting people onto these disease modifying drugs quickly, more than twice as good as where I work in London, for example. And we need to look into why that is. So just to summarize, we showed that recorded inflammatory arthritis diagnoses dropped substantially during the early pandemic and there's not been a rebound increase as of yet. Uh, but for people who did present, care was comparable, if not slightly better than pre-pandemic uh, for some metrics. But importantly, it was shown that we didn't have to use any manual data collection for this or manual data entry. And uh, the plan going forward is to use this to augment what is done uh, and then expand to loads of other conditions, which should hopefully be relatively straightforward. Thank you very much. Hello, afternoon. Um, hello, and cheap seats. I'm Felix. I am Director for Science, Evidence, and Analytics at NICE. And so I haven't done any clever research like all of these people. I've just used all of their clever research, um, but it's been incredibly useful. I just want to make a few reflections about this journey that we've been on in partnership with Open Safely, with the Bennett Institute. It, it, it's been really, and in fact, before I was at NICE, was the, first, the first time I heard about Open Safely properly was when that first paper came out, the one about the risks. The one that had amazing diagram of all the sort of risk ratios in the different groups. And I was working somewhere between Public Health England, the Cabinet Office, DHSC. I remember printing it off the printer and sort of putting it in my pocket to go to meetings at the Cabinet Office or in Parliament, where they were, they were trying to work out how to reopen Parliament. And they were like, well, is it really that bad, the risk in the much older groups? And I remember sort of unfolding this sort of primitive bit of paper, but it had the new data, it had the first proper national level data, data from our own population. And it was just such a powerful policy sort of intervention, that paper. And I, I know it's used in all those other things like the, the shielding list, uh, amongst other things to make some really important decisions. But, but more broadly at NICE, we've been using Open Safety. We, we've really enjoyed being a partner organisation, working on that data around long COVID, working on that data around the COVID therapeutics. We're making decisions that are really quite consequential in terms of the amount of money that gets spent, which population groups critically get access to these drugs. And so the ability to work in real time, so close to real time data, to get Laurie's data, the data from sort of many people across this group, to actually understand whether those medicines were working in practice at the time and how the, the therapeutic effect altered with, um, with each wave of, uh, of the variant. It's something we've never been able to do at NICE before. We are making decisions in a different way because we've got good, high quality, very close to real-time data in a way that we haven't had before. Um, and we've also had people embedded within the Bennett Institute being a part, you know, our, we have, we've got some great data scientists but, uh, within our organisation, but being able to sort of come into a community and use your, your co-pilot programmes to learn how to use it, to have our outputs checked, that's been incredibly useful. Uh, and so we've really, really enjoyed doing that and looking for further areas where we can collaborate in the future. But a couple of further requirements that we might want from the system here. That example what was it, of um, how we can measure our quality standards. So we set standards for the system of what good care looks like, but very often we don't actually know whether that care is provided in, sort of in reality out there. Why can't we get to a system where every quality standard we publish has the equivalent automated measurement uh, of what's happening. How can we create guidance in a new computable way that allows us to be able to sort of have that real learning health system of that future, that real system that learns, that's constantly bringing in that data. And I think working in partnership with academic groups, people like the Bennett, it's just gonna be such a core part of that because you've broken ground in terms of creating the ability to do that. So, uh, and I just wanna say that I think we've got, we're starting to develop a new, capability nationally, something that we didn't have before. The stuff that we've learned from our work with Laurie on therapeutics, with the, the wider open safety community, in terms of continual measurement 
of the effectiveness of interventions in practice, whether that's the COVID therapeutics, whether it's sort of new drugs that we're going to be deploying into primary care. You know, for example, we've got some really interesting new drugs coming out, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, semaglutide, the drug that sort of makes people thinner. That's probably going to be, well, it may be rolled out to quite a large extent in primary care. And the ability to link some of these data sources, data sources to be able to link blue tech to the primary care record, that means we can actually watch in close to real time who's getting the treatments and what, effectiveness is, what, what the effectiveness is. So from NICE, we would like to say a massive thank you to the team at the Bennett uh, and all the collaborators we've had because we really think it's made a difference. It's changed decisions we're making in real time and we think it's building a new national capability around real time measurement for the future. Thank you. Hello. Right, here we go. I'm Sarah Scobie and I'm Acting Director of Research at the Nuffield Trust. We are a health policy think tank and we have worked with Open Safely to understand end of life care um, for people who died at home. So why did we want to do this? Um, well the reason was there was a huge jump in the number and proportion of people who died at home at the start of the pandemic um, and that's a trend that was happening before COVID, but it's really accelerated and has continued to happen. So we wanted to understand what services people received, um, particularly given the huge disruption in, in all health and, and social care services. Um, and we really needed <coughs> primary care to do this as, as well as um, other data sets we've used before from hospital care. So what did we do? Um, we compared two cohorts of patients a pre-pandemic cohort and a cohort from the first year of the pandemic um, and we defined the cohorts so that we could look back at the care that people received in the last three months of life. Uh, we also had a patient public involvement group that met a couple of times um, and we shared our findings with them as we went along and, and got their reflections which were really, really helpful. Um, there's a link to our report if you get a chance to look at it. So I'm just going to focus on a couple of areas of the findings, um, looking at particularly the community care um, um, and the care outside of hospital. So we saw a big jump in the number of interactions that people had with their GP. So this is the cohort of people who died at home. Um, we also saw a jump in the number um, and the quantity of medications for symptom management at the end of life that people received. Um, the proportion of people for whom palliative care was identified in the record remained about the same as did the community nursing contacts. But just to bear in mind the huge increase in the numbers of people who were dying at home, so the huge additional number of contacts that were going on in primary care for this group. We did have some interesting discussion with our patient and public involvement group um, around the findings in particular whether people were spending more time trying to get the care they needed because it was quite difficult to access some services. So there's a lot more to kind of unpack, I think, with, with, with some of the findings. Um, just to share a little bit on health inequality. So we looked at, um, for example, the variation between the uh, uh, deprivation groups. Um, and we saw that the inequalities that existed before the pandemic increased. So the, in, uh, in the most deprived areas, the, um, the increase in contacts didn't happen at the same rate as it did in the least deprived areas. Um, and there was also a greater proportion of people dying at home uh, in the least deprived areas as well. So a lot going on and a lot to unpick in terms of what's happening in different parts of, um, you know, in different communities that makes it easy or more difficult for people to access different kinds of services. Uh, so, just a few thoughts, I mean, for us, we couldn't have done this data and this work without, oh dear, I don't want to do that. Somebody wants to intervene, because I do the wrong thing. Might need uh, <laughs> oh. the skin to come along. Okay, <laughs> okay so anyway, I'll just waffle on for another 30 seconds, which is that um, we couldn't have done this without primary care data. Uh, 
for us, um, it was it was fantastic, and we learned a lot from it. It was great to be able to create defined code lists. So, for example, we tried to replicate some of the nice quality standards in our data about um, end of life care. Uh, some limitations were that we were working only on the TPP data set, so there were some big differences in 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 geographical coverage um, for that. And I think the last slide, yes, acknowledgements to our great team, um, to our advisory group, and of course, to our patient public role group, Open Safely and TPP. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marvel Arab. I'm a senior research associate at the University of Bristol. I'm here today to talk to you about our study that aims to investigate events of various outcomes following SARS-CoV-2 infection. So our study aims to answer mainly two questions. The first one, are there high rates of an incident outcome in those with COVID-19 diagnosis compared to those before or without diagnosis? And secondly, um, are there, uh, does the vaccination lower the risk of these events in people with COVID-19 diagnosis? And to answer this question, we uh, use the Open Safely TPP data to build three cohorts based on the pandemic era, the pre-vaccination cohort, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated cohort. We built Cox model, we adjusted for um, age, sex, and several covariates to uh, minimize confounding factors. We also performed subgroup analysis to identify uh, differences between different population uh, groups in the population. And let's take a look at uh, an example of our results in cardiovascular outcomes. Um, here we see the result of arterial thrombotic events and venous thrombotic events. On the x-axis, we have weeks since COVID. On the y-axis, we have hazard ratios and 95% confidence interval. Um, the yellow line repre represents the pre-vaccination cohort. The blue line represents the unvaccinated cohort. And the green line represents the vaccinated cohort. So our results mainly shows that uh, there is a higher risk of uh, these cardiovascular events uh, uh, especially from week one to week four, and uh, the, the hazard ratio remains elevated up to two years in the pre-vaccination cohort. Um, we also see that the um, hazard ratios in the vaccinated cohort is lower than uh, those in, vaccinate, in unvaccinated and in the pre-vaccination cohort. Um, we also, in the, our subgroup analysis, we see that um, there are high rates of uh, cardiovascular events in those hospitalized with COVID-19 compared to those non-hospitalized with COVID-19. Um, and um, to summarize, uh, our study showed that there is high hazard ratio for cardiovascular events in the pre-vaccination and unvaccinated cohort compared to the vaccinated cohort. So this suggests that the um, vaccination does uh, may lower the um, the, the rates of uh, incidence uh, outcomes in cardiovascular uh, diseases. And we also have seen higher hazard ratios in individuals hospitalized with COVID-19. Uh, we are currently conducting ongoing work, ongoing work to study uh, several outcomes uh, like diabetes, mental health, gastrointestinal neurodegenerative, and autoimmune outcomes. And thank you. Sounds great. If you'd like to sign up and join, it's jobs.opensafely.org forward slash apply. Uh, just to finish off session there, we're going to talk a little bit about NHS service analytics. So this is some of our research that we classify as NHS service analytics, where we, we're really looking at what's going on in the NHS today, this week, next week, so we can give the data to policymakers to make rapid changes. Um, Helen and Vicky are going to talk lots about some of our exciting projects. Uh, first of all, some of our principles that we, we really keep in mind when we're trying to pick what we do uh, to ship to the front line. So analysis that are relevant to policymakers and the front line. It's key, sometimes we forget about that, but we're constantly, there's a big group of us who work in the NHS on a day-to-day basis, and we're talking about the problems we see, we're talking to other people like TPD and Emus who are talking to their customers, and uh, working out what's important, what's difficult, what's hard, what do we really know, what's happening. 
um, we capitalize on the same architecture we use for research. So we haven't built something else to do analysis for the NHS front line. We haven't built new systems. We don't have different IG processes. We use the same, the curation, the variables people talked about. We use the same ones, we just use them in a slightly different way. Uh, fast flowing data, so everything is fast, it's near real time in open safely, and we really use that data uh, to give the feedback that we need to ship quickly. Again, reusable code, slightly different to the variable, picking off the variables, but we reuse the complete pipeline, so then sometimes we say one click, but it's actually a few clicks of the buttons, we can rerun every single week analysis that a policymaker has found useful, a thing that an NHS region has found useful. We don't have to start from scratch again and again. Federated analytics for our, some of our research, it's quite okay to do it in EMIS or TPP, but actually in our NHS service analytics work, probably will be okay, but we want to focus on the things that we really need 58 million records for, and I think when Helen Vicky will speak, you'll guess why. We do ship papers, but again, like open prescribing today, we ship dashboards. You've seen some of them today, but go on reports.opensafety.org. Have a look. If you have ideas, if you have problems, you've seen things local area that you want to know more about, get in touch, ask us questions. On to Helen. Hi everyone, I'm Helen Curtis. I'm a researcher in the Data Lab, uh, sorry, the Bennett Institute. Um, I'm going to talk about two of our service analytics reports. The first one is our COVID 19 vaccine coverage um, report. Um, so this aims to describe the percentage of the population receiving various COVID vaccines um, split by the priority groups and key demographic and clinical um, criteria that we can uh, establish using the detailed data available in Open Safety. Uh, these are a couple of examples. Uh, we show an ethnic breakdown and a uh, presence or absence of chronic cardiac disease. Uh, we were able to implement this uh, incredibly rapidly uh, from when the first vaccine was given, we executed our first analysis uh, only a week later. And a week after that, we were emailing ministers with our key findings uh, to help inform the rest of the vaccine rollout. We developed this into a preprint uh, by about a month later. Uh, it was initially in the TPP backend only, which was more developed, uh, but we expanded this to include the EMIS as well and submitted a full paper by uh, the early summer. Uh, in the meantime, we continued to uh, email ministers and um, we made weekly reports uh, available online uh, from early February and uh, we increasingly added more detail and different doses of the vaccines as time was going. Uh, the second report I'm talking about is the Service Restoration Observatory. Uh, so this aims to monitor um, what's happening in primary care during and after the pandemic and to help, again, inform recovery of services uh, where <coughs> things have been uh, affected on an ongoing basis. We started by looking across the whole of the large scale um, primary care data. Um, we ran a hypothesis blind analysis to identify the most commonly used clinical codes and we generated lots and lots of um, trends charts showing what happened to the, how many of these codes were used over time. Uh, we identified two initial areas of interest um, to focus on, which were respiratory related activities and pathology tests. We consulted with a clinical advisory group which contained GPs, pharmacists and other specialists relevant to the reports. Uh, and based on our initial findings, uh, our advisory group help to interpret what was going on and identify which were the most important um, codes to monitor. We then expanded to six further areas including female health, uh, mental health, uh, processes related to medication such as medication reviews. Uh, and a couple of examples from the pathology report. Uh, on the left you see serum cholesterol testing uh, which is usually not uh, an urgent thing for clinicians to do. Um, you see this common pattern, when the pandemic hit, uh, there was a sharp drop and then recovery quite rapidly back towards normal levels by the end of the year. Uh, there are various other patterns we see in how clinical codes are recorded. Um, another example is blood coagulation testing, which is um, critical for patient safety. 
that was well maintained uh, compared to many other boats. More on this in the next talk. Um, then we looked across our eight clinical topics and consulted with our clinical advisory group again uh, to identify the most important measures across all of these codes uh, for monitoring primary care activity. We came up with 11 key measures. Uh, these are presented in our key measures report. Uh, blood pressure monitoring is one of the examples uh, shown here. Uh, so this is openly available online and regularly updated. Uh, currently in a preprint. And that's it for me. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a patient safety alert um, about direct oral anticoagulants. Now, I'm giving this from the perspective of a specialist anticoagulation pharmacist and now um, a very happy employee of uh, the Bennett Institute. So, what happened? So, I think the first thing to know is anticoagulants are high risk drugs. When things go wrong with anticoagulants, it can be really quite serious. Um, so I'm going to talk about a patient safety alert um, for patients who have mechanical heart valves. And during the pandemic, um, there was some inappropriate switching from warfarin, which is the recommended anticoagulant therapy or blood thinning therapy, um, to the direct oral anticoagulants. Now, key thing to know, patients on warfarin need lots of blood tests and they need that so that the warfarin could be prescribed uh, safely and effectively. When I say frequently, I, I'm talking weekly. The direct oral anticoagulants, they don't need that routine monitoring, and so they're much more straightforward. But we can't give patients with mechanical heart valves the direct oral anticoagulants because we simply don't know um, that they work. And indeed, there's some negative evidence um, for the for the direct oral anticoagulants for mechanical heart valves. Um, so, these frequent blood tests, they're a problem when, it, uh, when the pandemic struck. Across healthcare, we were trying to think, how can we stop or reduce the frequency of patients coming into uh, our clinics for face-to-face -face appointments for blood tests? So, in March 2020, uh, NHS England issued a directive to anticoagulant services saying, look, here's some suggestions for what you could do to reduce the frequency of patients coming in and out of clinics uh, for these blood tests. One of those suggestions was to switch patients from warfarin to the direct oral anticoagulants, where appropriate. And what we see here on uh, the plot on the slide is uh, the number of new prescriptions for direct oral anticoagulants across all indications, uh, and month that's a monthly... Uh, rate um, presented in thousands and you can see there a really big peak around March 2020. This was a real big call to action in the anticoag clinics. We were switching lots of patients very quickly. 12.2% of patients on warfarin switched to a DOAC. So it's a lot of switching happened very quickly. So some time elapsed and uh, the patient safety team re received reports that patients with mechanical valves had switched to direct oral anticoagulants and they really needed to get a feel for whether this was a small problem or a big problem because patients with mechanical valves, they really, really must be, have that precious metal in their heart protected. So um, they contacted Bennett and the team at Bennett worked rapidly to be able to work out how many patients with mechanical valves had recently been switched to a direct oral anticoagulant. And at that time, I worked very closely with Brian so we could make a code list that would only capture patients who had metallic, metallic heart valves in situ so that we were really careful with the information that we were putting back um, to the patient safety team. So we looked across 58 million NHS records and found just under 17,000 patients with a mechanical heart valve in situ or clinical coding that suggested that. 4% of those were, present, were recently prescribed a DOAC. That is not an insignificant figure and um, the patient safety team put out um, a national patient safety alert. The difference with this alert was that um, we 
shared our code with TPP and EMIS, EMIS and they directly alerted clinicians. So pay, um, GPs sat in their practices, had a list of patients pop up that were potentially affected um, who had a mechanical valve and had been prescribed a DOAC. Because of this code sharing, it meant that these patients could be recalled rapidly. So it was really good because the first thing I would ask myself or did ask myself was, did we do that? Did we switch someone? And this made a difference on the front lines, getting those patients in and switched. So in summary, we rapidly provided um, this information back to um, the safety team. The alert went out and the alert was great because it meant that those patients that were affected got uh, assessed and sorted rapidly. So that's it. So, as we've discussed throughout the whole of today, all of our work is admittedly technical, but it's also practical and applied. And lastly, of course, it is extremely collaborative. And in Open Safely, you can see that in the meat and the drink of the work. Open Safely was not collaborative in the sense of people having meetings with each other to make plans, to talk about doing stuff together, working on single projects. It was collaborative in the true sense of deep technical collaboration with TPP, the first place where we implemented Open Safely and where most of our outputs to date have come. We were working from the very outset, <coughs> hand in glove, and it was a truly extraordinary piece of work. First of all, it's astonishing to me that historically people doing work, research work and analytics work with electronic health records haven't sat down and done deep, detailed work with the people who actually build the software systems that generate the electronic health records. And I can confidently tell you that the people that we've met at TPP and at EMIS who work with that data day in, day out, who generate that data day in, day out, have a phenomenal, phenomenal body of knowledge. And what we've tried to do in Open Safely is to try and capture that knowledge from TPP, from EMIS, from our own analysts, from the analysts at London School, from Bristol, from Manchester, from NICE, from UXA, from everywhere, to try and capture that knowledge and avoid what happens in the past, where people write their Python scripts, they write their SQL scripts, and then it disappears. It's never reused, it's never seen. All those moments are lost like tears in rain. <laughs> so, with TPP and EMIS, we've built something, I think, truly extraordinary. They've both given their help and support pro bono throughout the pandemic. And we're working towards different commercial models for the ongoing operation of Open Safety. We've also worked very closely with NHS England. NHS England from the outset, in particular, have been the data controller of Open Safely. And that was also very important to us. We don't want to be the controller of the data. In legal terms, I think it's more important and appropriate that the NHS should be the controller of the data. And I do have problems with some of the models where other entities become the controller of enormous data sets. But I also think morally, ethically, and in terms of how it looks to the outside world, it is critically important that NHS England is the controller of the data. Ming Tang, who we'll hear from also in a moment, is Director of Data and Analytics at NHS England, and a god among humans it is rare and unusual, I can promise you, to meet people at the top tables in the NHS who have the scale of deep, technical, hands-on, practical knowledge around data and analytics that Ming has. So first up, I'd like to invite Chris Bates to talk about our work. Can you go? Potentially have slide. Yeah, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep this brief. I'm perturbed by Seb and Amir up there. Looking like I'm going to cast some Kafkaesque judgment on me. Um, so I'm going to give you the, the TPP perspective on this very briefly. Um, I'm led to believe that you heard the how we made friends with the Bennett Institute story, but I'm going to give you my perspective on it, which is ever so slightly different. Um, so this is the, the, the tweet that Ben put out in 2018. You look at the date, the 21st of December at 2.40, 2018, to say there's a GP system supplier costing the NHS about £10 million a year. Um, that's great, and it was a great piece of work, unless you're me and you just turned up here for a lovely Christmas weekend away, uh, and you get the kids out and you check your phone and you check Twitter and you think, oh God, 
Um, that guy's got half a million followers. This isn't going to go well. Anyway, it did, and it was the start of a brilliant you know, collaboration because we were able to, it was something that was totally unavoidable, we were able to get in touch with Ben's team. And as you've heard, there's kind of that thing about you know, what was the good news story. And this was Brian posting on the 29th of January. At this point, it was fixed, and we'd, we'd be able to, to do that collaborative work to look at that, the data to make front end changes to the system and you know, make a big difference to the NHS. So, you know, it's a great story. I still hold that they, they, Ben and Brian owe me a weekend. But, <laughs> but it was great. And if you read this blog at that point, you know, what's the bigger picture? Collaborative open working. We think it's a great illustration of how things should work with a small team of clinicians, researchers, and software engineers, and you could have written that about open safely. So it was, you know, it was some time before where I think this idea worked. That if we bring together small focused teams of EHR vendors and researchers working with and on behalf of the NHS, we can, we can do some brilliant things. If we then go to the origin story, um, from our point of view, it was brilliant. I mean, we'd met Ben at a conference at the start of March, just when the pandemic was you know, starting to take hold where the, the conference gift was some hand sanitizer. Um, but that was like, it was like great, it was like gold dust. Um, and we met and we agreed to talk about pop-ups and we're still really interested in how uh, we, we do better decision support inside systems. We want to do that in a systematic way. And then when we got to the sort of any other business, um, Ben suggested we should build the biggest COVID research database in the world. And what did we think about that? And it was kind of a seminal moment. And I, in my head, it's kind of a big thing. We were all kind of Churchillian about it. But if you read the origin story that Jess Morley wrote, apparently I just started laughing and wouldn't stop laughing while saying the word yes. I don't quite remember that. Anyway, what did happen definitely was, uh, you know, I walked across the office and spoke to our chief exec, Frank Hester, and the rest of the board. And within 10 minutes, five minutes, we were on board with this and called Ben back to say, look, we're up for it. We'll do this for free. We'll stand up the infrastructure. Let's get cracking. I think about 30 minutes later, we got a phone call from Seb um, and we started to plan the technical bits, the IG bits, the data linkage bits, etc. So really, I mean, from our point of view, and everybody said everything today, but we're, we're, we're honoured that we've been able to work with the Bent Institute uh, and, and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and then broader into other agencies and other uh, universities to do this kind of work. Uh, it's exactly what uh, we want to be able to support uh, with healthcare data and with the HR data. The UK's got a, a massively powerful resource here. So across the entire company, we're really proud of what we've been able to do uh, and long may it continue. I mean, we've been through this kind of thing before with you know, programmes people will know about, like care.data. This stuff's hard, it's difficult to do. When Ben made the decision, let's try and do it, you know, it was a, it, it's a difficult thing to do, but we thought this was the right team. If anybody was going to deliver, it was this kind of collaboration. Um, we're delighted that it's been able to, to go forward. We're delighted it's got such public support and such support from organisations such as Med Confidential. You know, across the board, this approach has been uh, just a delight for us to work with. We're really pleased when we hear uh, Vicky talking earlier about how we can close that loop between research and then bringing that back into EHR systems to directly you know, tell GPs these are the patients you need to look at you know, or broader into to other sectors. I think it's fantastic. We think it's great that we're able to expand the use of technology. So now with Ros and team at uh, LHSTM using a patient app to collect things you can't traditionally collect in, uh, in EHR data. And we can't put more burden on GPs to collect more data items but we can get people, in this case, people living with long COVID, to start to input more data, so we're enriching the data set with different technologies. And finally, I think the most important bit for this has been that communication, that collaboration. We've all just been able to hang out in a Slack channel and ask a load of questions about what data collection's like. Can we do this? Can we do that? Um, you know, what's the quality of that data? How would we link this data set? So really bringing together EHR vendors and, and epidemiologists and software developers at the Bennett Institute side has been a revelation. To answer almost one of the questions finally that, that came out from Alex there at the end, does this happen around the world? And as Ming said, there's some work going on in Singapore. What we'll say is we work around the world. We work in China, Southeast Asia, uh, the Americas, for example. And every Ministry of Health, every agency we speak to is interested in the open safety story. They've all got the same problem of how do we liberate the power of health data whilst protecting confidentiality and privacy. The Bennett Institute guys have shown how to do it. Uh, we will promote that all the way around the world so we can keep building and keep trying to do better analytics for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I must say, it has been a romp with both TPP and Enos. As Seb said, one of the great joys of Open Safely is that when you standardise your code, when you automate, you get the ability to run federated analytics, the same code, the same analysis, running in two completely different locations, 
to completion without any manual labour, without any fiddle and fuss, without writing the code twice. You press a button and more or less, more or less, it runs. So next, I'd like to speak, uh, hear from uh, Emis. Thank you, Ben. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Ben's talked about the expertise that vendors brought to this project. I'm going to talk about how, as a vendor, what we've learned from the project, because it's, it's really important that we, as vendors, take uh, cutting-edge projects like this and what we've learned from it and embed that into the system. My name is Mihal Mohammed. I'm the Head of Product Management for Research and Life Sciences at Amos. What that means is uh, my, my team is responsible for the part of this analytics platform that deals with uh, research and enabling uh, initiatives and projects like uh, Open Safely. Um, you might, you probably know of Emis Web, but you might not have heard of Emisx analytics platform. So before I go to the next slide, just a bit of overview of what Emisx analytics is. So it's a way, it's our answer to bring Emis web data, which is the electronic health record system, its data into a centralized platform where it can support initiatives like this at scale, safely and ethically. We've heard, of, we've heard about how rich this primary care data set is, and you can see it in the data lake. Um, this is just a small uh, indication of how important and valuable this data set is. But this also means that there are principles that you have to follow as a vendor. And working with Open Safely and, and, and the team, it brings these important principles uh, forward to, to vendors to, to think about. So, one, so these are the principles our team follows within EMSX Analytics. So we make sure that our projects and initiatives are beneficial to the patient, data subject, data controllers, and community at large. Make sure it's transparent. So you've heard of how transparent uh, open safety projects are. And very importantly, privacy. So this is embedded into the Unisex Analytics platform. How do we support privacy? How do we enable this for uh, projects like Open Safely? And it needs to be evidence-based. It needs to support research that's evidence-based. And needs to be safe. The data transfer, handling of the data, it needs to be uh, supported in a safe manner. It, 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 I've got only five minutes, so I can't go into the details of this, this diagram, but this is an attempt to describe how the data from Emis Web, which is the EHR system, flows into Emis X Analytics Data Lake. Um, and we previously heard about how important it is to make this data into a, an, in, into a stage where it can be queried as a researcher. But there's a step happening before that, where the system data is converted into what we call as a primary care view, where um, the system, if you think of the system data in, in a set of tables, it makes it easy for us to then create a, a, a data view which can be supplied to uh, Open Safely team to be supported within the Open Safely infrastructure. The other important thing that we've learned in working with the Open Safely team is what's there called access guard. So this allows us to control who has access to this data um, in a digital uh, fashion and in a very fast manner. So it allows us to say this person who's trying to access this data, uh, which is open safely, has the right to access these data from these uh, data controllers and so on. Just to touch on, as I mentioned, we, we as vendors, we've learned quite a lot through this project. What we've learned is if you have the right infrastructure, you can do this. You can enable uh, technology, you can enable research at scale and safely and ethically. But also the other thing we've learned is to do this, you have to embed legal and ethical requirements into the system, which is what we're trying to do with our data analytics platform. And we've heard about the importance of leaving the data at source. So that Emis Analytics platform is designed to do that, and we've learned how to do that through this project. 
I left the last bit uh, because it's the most, we, we, what we've learned is the most important bit, which is research and what you learn from research needs to find its way back into the system, into the uh, supplier system so that GPs and healthcare professionals can act on it and make an impact on patients' lives. So, thank you very much. And now, Ming Tang, Director of Data and Analytics at NHS England. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't actually have any slides, so that's okay. I thought I'd just <laughs> um, say a few words. It's really good to be here because I'm just thinking when was Care.Data? 2013. 2013. That was my introduction to NHS England. It wasn't a great time. And I remember when we were doing the kind of exploratory workshops, someone popped their hand up and said, couldn't we do this virtually? Couldn't we do a virtual data access layer? And everyone said, no, can't possibly do that. So we went down that track. So I'm more delighted than anyone that you know, OpenSafety has actually managed to make that virtualized environment work and that we've done it on the most rich data set that we have, which is the GP data. And we've actually managed to access some of the data, the clinical registries, the secondary use data to actually link up that data all virtually to allow the rich research that we've been hearing about all day. I guess looking forward, I'm really excited to work more closely with Ben, A, working on the, the hearts and minds to get the legal basis correct from COPE into kind of our NHS England COVID-19 directions, which is a legal mechanism to make all the work that you're doing legal. Um, but longer term, we want to add it to other directions and that will then open up, open safely to do work on other things. So that's kind of what we work to work through. We need to do it slowly, slowly and make sure that we bring everyone with us and actually the patients and the public to, to demonstrate the power of this. You know, we've talked about Ben kind of doing the open prescribing version um, to look at how do we look at variation in clinical practice um, with clinicians so that GPs can actually see where their operating, their kind of metrics are different, where they're prescribing differently. Not always with a lens of you know, if people doing things wrong, quite often see where the new innovation is and how we can adopt that new innovation. Um, so those things are coming, but I'm very clear that we need to bring together the data access, kind of the curation power that OpenSafely has started um, to develop, and we want to increase that across the NHS so that we're not just doing it for the research environment, we're also looking at it for operational data. So the NHS England analysts I have quite a large number of NHS England analysts that need to be trained up and geared up in how to use this data and make the best use of it so that we can close that loop, that feedback loop of policy to kind of research and actually practice and then feedback the improvement that we can make, really drive improvements in, in real time. So that's the value of making sure this partnership works. But the depth and the breadth of making sure that we're really focusing on evidence-based development is really important and working with the clinicians both as an end-to-end -end because what we really need to use the information for is to improve services for the individual. At the moment it's really hard in the NHS to drive data for the person. You know, we do not really do personal data. <laughs> what we do is service data and then we're trying to link the person across those services. So we need to link up all the data to allow us to look at how does the person interact with our services and how are we treating that individual to make sure that they are getting the best treatment possible. But actually we're also learning and we're not, we're not putting them through, you know, in this day and age, it's not really acceptable for patients to be waiting for many times and all the handoffs that they have to do between secondary care, primary care and community. We want to make sure there's a streamlined basis. Wouldn't it be lovely if we could actually think about what's the life course that we do with patients or people, you know, from birth to death? What are the things that we should be taking a more proactive activity, anticipatory care in that sense, 
across that pathway so that we can improve care for all. So they're the things, and really bringing population health to, to life. So there's quite a lot of stuff that we need to um, put together in that jigsaw puzzle. Open Safely will play a big part in that, the medicines and the therapeutics. As we advance towards genomics, how do we bring those genomic therapeutics through? It's a really important part of the national infrastructure and for England and the UK to be advanced on that and making sure that we're working with universities and industry to advance all of that. So that's all positive stuff. We've got some basic work to do, Ben. Lots of you know, negotiations <laughs> still to be done, um, but I'm very confident that we're onto a good thing here and that we're together we can make it really good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I must say, uh, I had COVID last week, and me and Ming, when I had a fever, were up checking PowerPoint slides for Joint GPIT Committee between 9 pm and 10 pm on Tuesday night. And that's how you know you've got real commitment from an organisation like NHS England. Um, it has been a joyful day, uh, and I hope you agree. We have a very high expectation of our guests. We have unashamedly gone beyond, don't you think data's beautiful? Don't you think data's so important? We have shown you the nuts and bolts of what we do. And some of that, for some of you, might have been too much. And that is OK. <laughs> when I came to Oxford in 2015, it was on one grant that was enough to cover me and a researcher. And I had this fantasy that we might go beyond just turning large data sets into academic research papers. Academic research papers are critical, but they're just one useful metric, one useful output. You've seen today about the power of turning data sets not into a static paper, but into live, interactive, data-driven tools and services. And I hope you've also got a flavour of how that's not, in quotes, just implementation. Doing that work requires that you have all the same tools, skills, and knowledge as an epidemiologist, a statistician, a data scientist producing a paper. You're using the same raw data. You're using the same coding frameworks, the same platforms. You've got the same ambition, which is to use data to reduce suffering and death for humanity. And it's always astonished me that the academic community has drifted towards, perhaps driven by metrics, has drifted towards thinking that the PDF on the academic journal website is somehow the canonical single output of most interest. What we've set out to do is to go beyond that, to take large data sets and turn them into machines that can reach out into the world and do some good. Now, when you do that, you're stepping outside some norms, and in particular, you're stepping outside of what funders can understand. And funders are what drive so much of the behavior in the academic community. So when we've built these services, we've often had to run up against the edge. Open prescribing was never at the outset funded by somebody funding a platform or a tool. Open prescribing was funded very generously by the health service, and I said to them, well, half a million pounds would help us do some randomised trials, comparing different ways of showing graphs to clinicians, knowing full well that we needed maybe 20 grand for that, and it would be nice to have about 440,000 to keep the platform running. And as we've gone, we've had to play these kinds of games. Welcome, in particular, has been the one conventional funder who have backed us full-throatedly as a team building platforms, tools and services. They are the funder who have shared our vision until Peter Bennett. Now, Peter Bennett, as you may be able to guess, of the Peter Bennett Foundation, has given an extraordinarily generous gift. As eternal life goes, and it's not really on offer, 
Funding a professorship at Oxford is actually quite a good way of getting it. There will be a Bennett Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine for eternity. And there will be a Bennett Institute. And what we're doing today and next week and week by week and year by year is building a template. We're turning our vision into reality. We're training, we're building things that actually work in the real world to turn our vision into reality. And there is a practical problem that underpins that. You need backing. In particular, you need to be able to pay people's salaries. So Peter Bennett, of course, with his generous gift, has resourced us in those terms. But there are two other great things that we have had from Peter Bennett. The first, I will downplay, because I don't want to talk about the details and the meat and drink too much in public, but he is, as you might expect from a very successful person, a rather good canny source of insights and suggestions around how to navigate institutions and ecosystems. But also, secondly and critically, when someone backs you, when you're doing something that's sometimes hard on its own terms, but also when you're doing something that is perceived by some to be transgressive, especially with some of our work on research integrity, on pushing open working methods, on doing audits of clinical trials transparency on a vast industry of academic and uh, commercial trials where people don't want to hear what you've got to say. Where you're giving the system the advice and the help that it needs but doesn't necessarily want. When you're stealing yourself and checking yourself to make sure that you're being fearless without being reckless. I don't think you can underestimate the importance of the moral backing of somebody coming to you and saying, do you know what? We only met recently. You've shown me your stuff and then we showed him again and then we looked again and again and again. And somebody says, do you know what? I'm going to back this. And crucially, with an endowment, I'm going to back it for eternity. The Lucasian professor of physics, what was that, 17th century? Who knows who Lucas was? But his name's still there. So, it is with great pleasure I introduce you to Peter Ben. It's a pleasure being here, it's a pleasure being here. This is a happy day, it's the first conference and uh, I am looking forward to many, many more. Um, it's nice to be at Jesus, we both are at Jesus now, I think, and um, this is the, you know, this is the very first. So I hope from here we just go on and leaps and bounds as only Ben and the team who I've met around him can do. Um, I met Ben four years ago, introduced by a former associate of yours at um, London School who was working with me, Chris Coldham, and he, he's over there, he said, you've got to meet this guy, and we had a conversation, I think we were in Hong Kong at the time, Chris, and uh, we spoke on the phone, and we thought, oh, we better go and meet you. So I think we took a, a it's probably a, a late November, early December, took a flight over and met, and yeah, looked like you really were the, the, the whole deal. Um, you know, you're clearly, Ben's clearly brilliant and unique, and uh, he passionately made the case to us for investing in the opportunities offered by proper and innovative use of data, which I don't know why that sounds, it just sounds so old fashioned now, but I guess four years, I mean, now we all know about data, we all know about you know, AI, etc. But four years ago, it was still kind of, oh, 
sounds interesting. But specifically, you know, Ben introduced the, the cutting edge work he was doing in public health data and his ability to have a good dialogue with the um, National Health Service. He shared his tools and how they could be used to inform better decisions and better outcomes in health. My immediate thought was, well, health is really, really important, really, really important, but there are so many other areas of public policy where we need the same tools. So um, we, I guess I was hooked because I could see not only what Ben was interested in, but coming from my backgrounds in finance and how you use data to make markets, to predict things, uh, how, well, basically how you use data to make money, which is all about being, you know, you've got to be pretty sure on the data and uh, uh, to be able to consistently make money. Uh, but that, that, re that work started probably 40 years before when, when finance got into data, uh, probably 20, 30 years before um, the health services got into it. Anyway, uh, I think I could see that there was, there was, a, uh, there was a lot to do here and the, the, the person who was pitching it happened to work at quite a decent place. I think Oxford's got a good reputation <laughs> as a university. Health is pretty good at Oxford. Um, the people I met around Ben, around ben included uh, Anthony and the development team, but a, a couple of others, and they were all just as inspiring, really. I think they really got how helpful it could be, not just for the population of England, but that this could, uh, in, in the health space, but this could be bigger than that. This could be global, and it could go beyond the health space. Um, so, you know, universities aren't always that quick to, to, to think through some of the other things, and Ben, I think, uh, really did, which was amazing. Um, most recently, Ben's, fortunately, there was a chair established, uh, for somebody to lead this, and fortunately Ben applied, and fortunately he got the chair. <laughs> so that was wonderful. After that, money started flowing. Um, but um, Ben supported by a team of very talented people. I'm going to say hand-picked. I'm guessing uh, they're all pretty well hand-picked, and he's not going to have people around who aren't very capable and who are not collegiate. So. Um, you know, this doesn't happen without a broader team. So I'm really excited to see the work that's going to come out. But I also want to make one other point. It's quite a long point. It's that this institute is for applied data science. So it is about the use of data for what? It could be healthcare. It could be extending life expectancy. It could be quality of life, but it can also be many other things because there's a lot of other data sets we have and in fact that are in the government arena. Um, so um, that is why it's about applied data science and not just about health. So I just want to make sure that you're aware of that vision, uh, but to be able to fulfill that vision, you have to have data integrity. Um, you know, that confidentiality is key, privacy is key, and um, it's going to be a very, um, you're going to be challenged all the way along to prove that you're not going to embarrass anybody as you use this data. So that it will be critical if we're going to be able to take data and techniques from this institute, from medicine, perhaps beyond medicine. Um, so. I, um, I, I also think that the ability to, which uh, again, Ben inspired me with, that we can do trials really quickly. Yeah, you're right, because I know when I go to the doctors, they ask me, what have you got? And they type, 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 and they're giving me output and just passing it on. I mean, you, you're going to be able to do trials really, really quickly. And I think that will be amazing. Um, the, as we look forward and we look at, back at the 
open safely in the Goldacre Review. How, how amazing was that to kind of get a review of a major sector of the economy uh, of life named after you? So uh, well done. That was very well done. <laughs> but uh, there is, as part of this vision, broader vision, there is a second chair. There's a second chair that will be seeking applications in the area of uh, applied data science, but with a vision that not only are we looking at health, we're looking beyond health to other areas. And uh, although this, you know, we're within the public um, health arena uh, and um, within the, the medicine department, that there is a broader vision. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody here is aware of that. Uh, broader vision uh, and that uh, what is in Ben and Oxford's hands is this delicate but it potentially enormous opportunity to look at data for um, improving not just life expectancy, not just quality of life, but everything from education. What's the best way to teach 11-year-olds or 15-year-olds? What's the best way to teach science or maths? What's the best way to deliver pensions? What's the best way to look at social security payments? All of these are areas that are, I think, um, when you have very large data sets, you can draw strong conclusions. So, you know, there's so much more that can grow uh, out of uh, the work that's being done here. And I'm really, really excited to look forward over the coming years to what you're going to come out with as a group. So thank you very much for putting up with me. Thank you, and thank you, and thanks to our people. Uh, Brian Eno, great record producer and keyboardist in Roxy Music, this will be relevant. <laughs> he once wrote an extraordinary essay in which he said, uh, people talk about genius, the idea of musical and creative genius, that there's a person that comes out with something extraordinary, that it just emerges from their mouth. And there are moments of exquisite creativity from individuals, and frankly, I think it frightens people sometimes if they're not creative. It is, after all, more frightening that a spider would crawl out of your mouth than it would crawl in. Um, but Brian Eno once said that the truly extraordinary things that happen are often not from single creative individuals, they're from a whole scene of people working together, sharing knowledge and understanding on the same train. And he called this senius. And I think that's what we have in our team. You couldn't buy some software developers, some epidemiologists, put them in a pot and stir them you wouldn't get the glorious cake that we have baked if you just put the ingredients in like that. So, I'd like you all to join me in a round of applause for our people and our users and our community.